and I now look to Jack Solomon, the 12th elected member of the Secretary's Committee, to continue the case for the proposition tonight. Union members, ladies and gentlemen, Anaz Shah, an anti-Semitic Labour MP, was supposed to be speaking on the proposition tonight before she had a very last minute change of heart uh, and pulled out. But little did she realise that she was going to be replaced by a very Semitic Jewish boy. <laughs> so, it really is an honour to be speaking here tonight and I'm immensely grateful to the Union for this opportunity. There are going to be three chapters to this speech, three nails in the opposition's coffin. Chapter one is titled, on controversial speakers and why they always come out on top. And this is going to blow Harry's mind. <laughs> the claim that comes from supporters of free speech from the opposition themselves is that people should be allowed to speak no matter what they have to say because their views will be interrogated and debated. They'll be asked questions, they'll be put in tricky situations, they'll be exposed to the marketplace of ideas. And in the end, the audience, if not the speakers themselves, will realise the error of their ways. They'll realise that racism is bad, that homophobia is offensive, that Milo Yiannopoulos is full of shit. In other words, the existence of both the redress for the harm created by controversial speech and the epistemic benefit of allowing that speech to be aired relies on the same key assumption. And that assumption is that whenever a speaker is given a platform to speak, an audience will be given a platform to respond, to disagree to make their own views known. And what I'm going to prove in this chapter of my speech is that the discussion, the debate, the interview is always rigged. The controversial speaker, no matter what they say, will almost always win. And there are five independent reasons why it is always rigged in their favour. Toby half preempts one of them. One, shock value. These speakers are talked about more, get more likes, and get more articles written about them than their opponents, because what they say, for better or for worse, is more exciting. They defy the norm. In other words, you'll never go viral for saying that being a dickhead is a bad thing to do, because everyone, bar some people on the opposition, already know that. What you do go viral for is saying controversial and offensive things, meaning that it is always in the favour of the speaker. Second reason, celebrity bias. The most deadly weapon that speakers like Alex Jones or Paul Watson have is their fame. You're far more likely to listen to someone famous, you're far more likely to believe them when you hear them speak, and you're far more likely to remember them when they are coming up on your Facebook timeline. Three, false equivalence. Controversial speakers claim a moral high ground as soon as they are invited to speak within the same chambers, same TV studios, and the same platforms as academics, as normal politicians, as experts. This is the one Toby tries to respond to, but you'll notice he never actually does. Four, controversial speakers know what to say. I don't mean that they are uncharacteristically intelligent or smart, evidently. What I mean <laughs> is that they have teams of writers and analysts behind them, media advisors who analyze which tweets do best and which ones do worst. They have snappy 20-year-old interns telling them what it is that people want to hear. Reason five, Controversial speakers, like these guys, preempt responses to what they say. Think about why questioning speakers like Steve Bannon always feels like you're banging your head against a wall. The answer is that these speakers build responses into their claims. So let me illustrate. If I say something not yet, offensive, and say that if anyone opposes me, in a moment, and say that anyone who opposes me is a snowflake, if you oppose me, you are already falling into my trap you're already losing ground. And that's exactly what controversial speakers make you do. And the TLDR of this point is the following. If you could place a bet on who is going to come out worse for wear, would you place that bet on a meek, anonymous student in the audience of a Richard Spencer talk? Or would you put your money on the flashy, quick-witted, controversy-inspiring man up the front with a microphone? Smart money would always say the latter. So for once, ladies and gentlemen, Defy the odds, vote against the controversial speaker, vote with proposition. Chapter two of my speech before that point of information. I thought once you knew all these five reasons, 
then you would come up to prevent all these because you have the same powers as these people have. If it's social media they are using, you have the same power. If it's money they are using, you the people who support non platforms yeah, yeah. have the same powers. So what has prevented you from knowing all these people? What has prevented you from combating them right from head to toe? Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the thing that is stopping me are the five characteristics I just talked about. I don't have the shock value, I don't have the team of advisors, I don't have the wit that a person like Ben Shapiro has, and that is why I'm always going to lose to them, and that's why any random student, student in an audience of a Steve Bannon talk will go unnoticed, but Steve Bannon will always be remembered. Chapter two of this speech, on why a right to a platform only makes sense if you believe that we have a right to be heard, and this one's going to blow Toby's mind. Let me explain. The principled argument uh, against uh, no platforming starts from the premise, even as Toby construes it, that we have a right to free speech, makes some inexplicable maneuver, and gets to the conclusion that we therefore have a right to be platformed. The reason why that teleportative leap from premise to conclusion is inexplicable is that a right to free speech just means that you can say whatever you want. It doesn't say to whom you can say those things, and it doesn't say where you can say those things. Most importantly, it doesn't entitle you to a platform. So the opposition, the Oxford Union, Fox News, Donald Trump, they're all grasping at the burning fibers of straws when they say that we have a right to free speech because the premise of their argument in actual fact is that we have a right to be heard. And if they could prove that, maybe they would stand a chance in this debate. But I'm going to explain why that argument will be about as rigorous as a Ben Shapiro meme compilation. And I'm going to start by getting you in the mood with some thought experiments. Thought experiment number one. Do you believe that an abortion clinic should have to have an above ground car park so that the words and beliefs of protesters should be heard? That is, should the government require that people listen to the protesters, that they do not take the back entrance, that they do not go in an underground car park? If you don't think that sounds right, you quite correctly do not believe in a right to be heard. Thought experiment number two. Do you believe that Facebook and Twitter and other social media networks should deliberately show racist posts to racial minorities. The, the families of those killed in Sandy Hook should have Infowars bumped up in their timelines just so that they are exposed to challenging or putatively free opinions. If not, you correctly believe that you are not entitled to be heard, that you have to earn the right to have attention. And here's why that's crucial in this debate. Being given a platform to speak guarantees you an audience. It constitutes you receiving the privilege that is being heard. And that is not a privilege that everyone deserves. It is not an inalienable right. It is something you have to work for and earn. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't invite anyone controversial to speak. I'm not advocating for that liberal fantasy. It does mean that certain people should not have the privilege of a platform. Speakers who espouse racist clickbait, speakers who deny fact, those speakers ought to be denied a platform. So look, I like free speech as much as the next guy, maybe not literally in this debate, but make no mistake, no thank you, that is not a reason to side with the opposition. Chapter three, on why the act of no platforming makes for better debate. Premise one, traditionally, speakers get a whole lot of mileage out of saying controversial things in particularly crass, clickbaity, or offensive ways. Things like facts don't care about your feelings, or statements to the effect of event X was not actually that bad, or group Y just doesn't exist. Premise two, the way in which speakers express their ideas changes for the better when they are no platformed or when they face that threat. When you, as a no platform speaker, want to decry the injustice that you say has occurred, you better be able to explain why you're the reasonable one, why actually your view has merit, why you've been incorrectly characterized. And to do that with any level of success, you need to use the logic of an argument, not just the headline. So the conclusion of that is that setting a precedent of no platforming forces speakers to express themselves in ways that are more acceptable to mainstream audiences. And that's a win, because it minimizes the offense created by their speech. Members, when you leave this debate, the right-hand side of that poll should be more congested than St. Michael Street on the day of a Steve Bannon protest. You should have no doubt that certain people have not earned the right to be heard. You should scoff with great conviction, though politely, 
and anyone on the opposition who says that the marketplace of ideas is the saving grace for their side of the debate. And you should recognize that the process of no platforming in itself improves the quality of discourse that enters the public sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe facts don't care about your feelings, but platforms absolutely should, and that's why this motion stands.